If you would, please open to 1 Peter, as Blaine's going to be continuing with the study in 1 Peter, chapter 1, 10 through 12. While you're getting there, uh, my name is Brad Luck, for those who don't know me, uh, the husband of Wendy, the father of Caleb and Samantha, and Samantha lowers her head there. Um, I thank you all for being here t- this evening as we continue to open to 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12. What a privilege it is to actually read the Word of God that has been entrusted to us. For so many people around the world cannot do this this morning, yet we have the privilege of doing so. So please, if you have it, please read along with me as we go 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, and these things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, things to which the angels long to look. This is the word of God. Good morning, church. Let me ask you a question. How are your eyes doing today? The reason I ask that is there seems to be a a common, peculiar eye disease that is uh, inherent to many of us because of our human nature. There's something wrong with our eyes. I know I struggle with it. I imagine that many of you struggle with it. It's, It's this problem that we can see everything out there that we don't have. But we, we struggle deeply to see what we actually do have. Do you have that disease? Like, I mean, for some of you, you may be like, what, what is he talking about here? Like, like most things that, that can be attributed maybe to sin, we, we see it in other people better than we see it in ourselves. And, and so let me, let me help you if you're struggling to know what I'm talking about. Um, you know, th- think about your, your really, really, really rich friend. Think about it. Like, I think of when I was in, in Hingham, Massachusetts. It's a suburb of Boston, a very wealthy um, community. Uh, and and there, there are a lot of families there that had au pairs. You know what an au pair is? It's kind of uh, an overseas nanny who comes in to watch the, the children. And, and, so, and a lot of people had those. But most people didn't have an au pair. And so every now and then you'd get like a group of ladies together and you'd have a mom who was there, and then she would start complaining. It's like, oh, I just, my au pair, you wouldn't believe it. They're just not, they're just not doing their job the way they're supposed to be doing their job. And, and every other woman in that group would be like, wait, you have an au pair? Right? Like, like, but the woman who was seeing it, like, had a struggle with her au pair. Like, she didn't realize how privileged she was that, that, that most people don't have the, the joy and the blessing of having an au pair. She can't see her own privilege. Well, church... Here's the bad news. We're the rich people. We're we're the rich people so often that there's so many of us who can't see their own gospel privilege. That what we've been talking about in in 1 Peter so far is where we've been getting a picture of our salvation. And we've been getting a picture of this thing that Christ has given to us. Last week we saw that it's, it's the most valuable thing that anybody could ever lay their hands on. Faith in Jesus Christ that's, that's going to result in our salvation, that's going to result in our heavenly home. There's, that there's the most beautiful and precious thing that has been given to us in Christ, and yet so often as Christians we, we struggle to see it. We, we don't even see the, the value of what's been given to us. We don't see our own privilege to be counted as children of God. Church, don't miss your privilege. I, I think that's at the heart of what Peter is doing as he's writing to this church in the first century. If, 
If you remember back from when we introduced, this is a church that is struggling and suffering. They're, they, they've come to faith. They've taken hold of Jesus Christ. And, and because they've taken hold of Jesus Christ, the, the culture around them is, is pressing in on them and and, and they're, they're persecuted, and they're, they're facing various kinds of trials. And in the midst of that suffering and those trials, their temptation is to forget the privilege that they hold on to as being saved by Christ. The temptation is to miss this and see all, of, all the circumstances out there. And that same temptation relates to us. But when things are hard for us as Christians, we're, we're tempted not to not to gaze and, and, and appreciate and delight in the salvation that's been given to us, but to see all those things that we, we don't have. Maybe for you it's not about suffering. Maybe, maybe it's not necessarily that, that being a Christian has brought particular suffering on you, but maybe you've just grown to that point in your Christian life where, where the gospel's, meh. You ever feel that? Yeah, I'm saved. Good. Get to go to heaven. Meh. Like, like there's no delight that there's no joy that comes out of this thing that's been given to you that you did not earn, that's been given to you as, as a gift. And so one of the things we want to consider today is, is look back at that gift. Look back at our privilege and, and see this thing that, that God has given to us. That's what Peter is encouraging the church here. Look at this privilege that you have. Now, the way that Peter is, is going to go about that in our text today is, is he's actually telling these first century Christians. He's like, look at the privilege of this salvation. Our very first line, concerning this salvation. So everything I've just told you about, everything of, of the hope of your heavenly home, the, the, the joy of your salvation, this, this valuable treasure that's been given to you, concerning that, you are privileged people. And he's going to demonstrate that privilege by showing us two things. There's two demonstrations of our gospel privilege in this text. And we're going to see, I want to see those two, the, the two demonstrations of our gospel privilege. And then at the end, I want to talk about three symptoms of that eye disease. Are, are you struggling to, to appreciate and recognize the privilege you have in Christ? And, and what are some potential symptoms that can help you see your own struggle in that? So the two demonstrations we're going to see, two demonstrations of our gospel privileges. First, the prophets of the Old Testament sought our privilege. The prophets of the Old Testament, they wanted what we have. They sought our privilege. And the second we're going to see is the angels themselves desire our privilege. The angels, the heavenly beings, what they want, what they want, not in like an envious kind of way. They're not, they're not sinning, but, but, but they, they want what we, church, have, that, that they want the, the privileged place in which we sit. So let's look at that. First, let's look at this. The prophets, the Old Testament prophets sought our privilege. Again, concerning this salvation, verse 10, the prophets who prophesied, so this is the, the Old Testament prophets, about the grace, again, that's connecting to the salvation, the grace that was to be yours. They search and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the, the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Let's take a, a pause there. They, they, they were prophesying in the Old Testament about a grace that was to be whose? Not theirs, it was to be ours. A, a grace that they, they started to get glimpses of and they, and they wanted, but it wasn't for them to take hold of, church. It was for us to take hold of, the, the grace that comes after the understanding of the cross and the resurrection. We see an example of this in Daniel and in, in his own desire to, to know and, and to experience the grace. Now, if you go to Daniel 12, Daniel has just seen this, this beautiful picture of what's going to happen in the end when, when those who are faithful are going to shine like the brightness of stars. There's going to be a, a, a glory given to those people who are saved and who are, who are righteous. And so then there's this question asked, the, the man of linen, and I'm not going to try to explain all this, but anyway, the man of linen comes down, maybe a pre-incarnate Christ, and someone asked him, someone asked that man, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? Like when when, man of linen, are we going to see these wonders? And, and he says, that the, the, so it's very clear here, that time, a times and a half time. What's that? 
There's how many people have spent so much of their life trying to figure out what a time, a times, and a, and a half time is. Well, the answer is we don't know. It, it was, it's veiled to us. The, the answer wasn't given because that's what Daniel says. like, wait, wait, I don't understand this. Verse 8, I heard, but I did not understand. And I said, oh, Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? He's saying, I've seen these glories, God. When, when can we take hold of them? And that's when God says, go your way, Daniel. For the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Daniel, these, these glories are, are not for you. They're, they're for another time. But, but he, want, he saw what Daniel saw and the prophets saw and Isaiah saw and Jeremiah saw. They, they, they saw a day when, when, when the gospel was going to be coming. They couldn't put their hands on it. They didn't know who the Christ was and how it was all going to unfold. But they, they knew a day was coming that was going to be a glorious and beautiful day. And they wanted it. But it wasn't for them. When you're a kid, maybe you're a kid now. And you run in, you know, you're, maybe you're coming home late from school, and it's a Friday, and, and you walk in, and you, as you, just as you're even coming in the, the, on the porch, and you're coming in that front door, the, the sweet smell just hits you. Oh, mom's been baking something good. I don't know, whatever is in your house, maybe it's a cake, maybe it's a, a pie, or, or I don't know, what, whatever that favorite dessert that she cooks. And you go, oh, oh, I want that. I, I, I can sense it. I just like, you know, your stomach starts doing that thing it does when you, you really are getting hungry and excited and you burst into the kitchen and you say, oh, can I have some? And mom says, it's not for you. <laughs> oh, but I can, I can smell it. I know it's going to be good, mom. I know it's, yeah, it's going to be really good. It's, it's, it's for the Johnsons. We're going to go over there and have dinner with them later. Oh, but mom, can I just get a, a little sliver, just, just a little bit right now? You could just give something. It's just like, well, no, 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 we can't. The, the preparation, the, you know, the decoration it has to be has to be right for the Johnsons. It's, it's not for you. Church, the prophets are those that come bursting and they smell the sweet smell. They know something so good is coming. We're the Johnsons. We're, we're the Johnsons that, that we actually taste of it. What, what they smelled and longed for, we actually get to taste. They smelled and longed for the salvation of Jesus Christ and, and the hope of that glory. We taste of the sweetness of the salvation of Jesus Christ. We are a privileged people. We forget that. That the Old Testaments of old just saw these, these glimpses and these pictures, and, and they knew it was beautiful. We actually get to take hold of that thing they were seeing. But, but our privilege doesn't just relate to this, the, the, the smell that they, they smell, and we actually get a taste of it. But, but here's another amazing thing that that Peter tells us about those Old Testament prophets, that men of renown, right? men of God who, who prophesied to the, the sufferings in Christ and the, the subsequent glories. In verse 12, it was revealed to them, the Holy Spirit's telling them that they were serving not themselves, but you. That the Old Testament prophets church the Old Testament, that God was using them not to serve themselves and not to, to serve their community and not to serve the people of Israel at that time. Who were the Old Testament prophets serving, according to Peter? Us. <laughs> like they, they, were, they were serving us. That you, you see your privilege. Like in this, the chronological story of God, we sit at a particular place that God appointed as a place of privilege and, and of honor. Not that we chose to be born and when we were born, but, but in God's grace and plan, as, as he was unfolding his glory, we have a, a privileged seat into it all. To understand this, to understand how, how, how are the Old Testament prophets actually serving us? What does that even mean? How, what, does that, what does that look like? Well, well, first we have to understand the continuity uh, of the Scripture. We have to see all the way from, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, we're talking about one story. This, this is all going and fold, unfolding together. Right, right? There, there's one message of Scripture. I love, I love that. Um, I don't know. Let me give a little plug for G3. If you're with us today and you're not plugged into a G3, let me encourage you to connect with that. Uh, if you don't know what that is, jump on the website, jump on the app or something, reach out to us. We will help you get plugged in as a 
It's a place to disciple one another, men with men, women with women, just getting into each other's lives, seeing us grow up. And, and Patrick, if you don't know Patrick, he's our pastor of discipleship and community. He's put together a great plan for our G's 3's this year. And we're going to be reading scripture, and we're also going to be reading some of these small books just to help us think through theology. And the very first one we're reading is called Biblical Theology. And the reason we're reading this book, Biblical Theology, is it's going to help us understand the one story of, of Scripture. That this wasn't 66 different books and letters that are kind of randomly collected together. That, that what we have in Scripture is one story that, that arcs all of the Bible. That there's one thing, and Christ is at the very center of that. And, and so when we're reading in Genesis or we're reading in in Leviticus or Numbers or Deuteronomy, ultimately what we're reading is the story of Christ. You see, there's, there's one ultimate story. There's, there's one ultimate problem and one ultimate plan for salvation. Just to give you a hint of that biblical theology and what we're talking about, right? God, Genesis 1, he, he creates, and he creates the world good. And all of his creation is, is good. And then at the, at the pinnacle of that creation, he creates humanity. And, and humanity was good. And, and he gave that humanity dominion over all the rest of creation. And, and that dominion was, it, it was good. And he made a covenant with humanity as they're exercising their dominion. He gave them instruction of, of how they were to exercise that dominion, what they were to do and what they were not to do. And then humanity... Humanity rebelled. Our, our first parents of humanity, Adam and Eve, they, they rejected those instructions. They rejected God's covenant, and they did the exact opposite of what he asked them to do. They ate of what he asked them not to eat of. They rebelled. They said, we don't want your rule. We want your dominion. We want, we want to be in control, but we don't want to be under you, God. We want, we want to be equal to you. And they rebelled against him. They sinned. And, and from that moment forward, all of creation came under the corruption of sin. And because all were corrupted by sin, each and every one of us, we committed sin. And then we deserve the penalty of sin, which is ultimately separation from God and separation from all spiritual life, death. Was introduced. We see that in Genesis 3, right? So we, in, in Genesis 3, in, in the kind of the, the pinnacle moment as God is, is, is punishing, in a sense, Adam and Eve for their sin, what does he do? He, he removes them from his presence. He takes them outside. He places them outside the garden. He put, places a cherubim to guard the garden to make sure that what is unholy cannot be with holy. What is unrighteous cannot be with the righteous. And, and that becomes the, the one problem that, that, that is the overwhelming problem that goes through the rest of Scripture is this question. How can unrighteous, unholy, sinful beings relate to a holy and righteous and perfect God? How is that going to happen? You know, Psalm 24 sums it up as David is, is writing Psalm 24. He, he asked the question, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who can draw near to God? Which one of these sinful beings is worthy to draw near to God? He's, he goes on, and, and how shall stand in his holy place? Who can approach within the temple of God? The holy and just God, the creator, the, the, the one who is perfect and pure and righteous. He gives us the answer to that in verse 4. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. To approach God, our heart has to be perfectly pure. Which, which one of us can do that? Do you have a, a perfectly pure heart? Your, your thoughts have always been pure. Your actions have always been pure. This is not the standard that's being placed here, and purity is not a standard of pretty good. Well, we, we like that standard better, don't we? Pretty good. Yes, I'm like, hey, why, why do you think you're going to go to heaven? Why do, you, why do you deserve to be in heaven in the presence of God eternally? I'm pretty good. You ever hear that? I'm better than most. I've done some pretty good things. 
a couple bad things, more, more, good, more good than bad. I think that's true. I've done more good than bad. You ever hear that kind of argumentation? Because what we love to do is we think of, hey, what standard do I need of, of, of goodness, of righteousness to, to spend eternity with God? We like to compare ourselves to other people. I'm not as bad as my friends. I'm not as bad as Hitler. Like we'll we, we, we always find a standard or bar that makes us feel good about our pretty goodness, right? But here's the problem. The, the standard that God puts forth is not a comparison with one another. It's a comparison with him. It, it's not a comparison with other pretty good humans. It's a, it's a comparison to the perfection and the holiness of God. And one blemish in the sacrificial system in the Old Testament, one blemish ruined a sacrifice. It wasn't worthy. One blemish, unpure. One little speck. Think of that pure white shirt you just got, brand new, bright, beaming white shirt. Take your wife out on a nice date. You decide to have spaghetti. Bad decision. You get a little over, you know, worked up on the spinning. And then the, 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 that noodle flips, that little piece of spaghetti sauce flips up on your shirt. It's not pure anymore. That one little speck. I'm not pure anymore. Which one of us? Which one? Friend, if you don't know who Jesus is, let me, let me put that challenge before you. If you haven't trusted in Jesus for your salvation, let me ask you that challenge. Are you pure? Is, is there not even that little speck on your shirt of cleanliness? That's the question. And, and, and the rest of the story is so people are asking, well, who? Who is going to do this? Who could stand before the Lord? Who, who can go up to his holy hill? Who is worthy of this? And the prophets began to see. The prophets were beginning to see that there is one who will be able to. There's one who will go forth. There's a, the, the story of the one who would, who would save us, it starts actually back in Genesis 3. In Genesis 3, as, as God is giving his punishment to, to uh, Adam and Eve, and he's getting ready to kick them out of the garden, he gives a sweet promise to Eve as he's talking to her. Some of, we, we call this the proto evangelion or the Proto-Evangelium, whichever you want to use, fine. But it, it, it's the, what we call it, it's the first gospel. There in Genesis 3, as he's getting ready to separate the people, he said, hey, here's what's going to happen. Or he's not talking to Eve, he's actually talking to Satan. He's, here's what's going to happen. Satan is the one who's caused, he's, he's deceived. He's like, there's going to be one who comes, and he crushes your head. But you know what happens when he crushes your head? Is you're going to bruise his heel. That means there's going to be one who comes. There's going to be one who comes, and, and, and he, he victors over sin and death. He victors over evil, but, but he's going to do so through suffering. He's going to do so through suffering. They, they began to see, as, as verse 11 says, they began to see the predictions of the sufferings of Christ. That one has to come and make a sacrifice for us. There's no greater text than what Patrick started the, the service with as we think about this. There's no greater prediction of what we need, what we need than Isaiah 53. Just, I'm not going to read the whole thing again, but just a, a couple of verses from 11 and 12. By, by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant. There's, there's going to be one who is righteous, who is pure, whose hands are clean. Christ. He will make many to be accounted righteous. He shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with many. He shall divide the spoil of the strong because he poured out his soul to death and the number with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, makes intercession for the transgressors. The prophet saw a day when Christ would come and he would stand in the judgment that we deserve to stand in. And he would take it. And he would take his righteousness and purity and he would give it to us. Those prophets never tasted that. We get to taste of that. 
And it's not just his sufferings. It's not just the cross they saw. What they saw was when this happened, when, when, when Jesus defeats evil on the cross, when he rose again conquering sin and death, what would follow would be subsequent glories. I don't think there's a particular glory he's talking about. I don't think there's, it's just the, the glory of, of Christ in his resurrection or the glory of, of Christ. And I think he's saying everything that unfolds when, when Christ conquers, as his kingdom is established, and as that kingdom is being unfolded, whether that's Christ's resurrection, whether it's his ascension, whether it's the, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the church, whether there's the salvation of many, whether it's the, the growth and spread of the church, whether it's the gathering of the nations for his people, all of it is glories that, that we're experiencing. We're in the midst of the glories of Christ, the others long to see. Isn't that a, a sweet reality that, that we get to take hold of what others wanted? It's a privilege. You know, well, how does that serve us? Like, like that, that's great, but how does it serve us? Because those predictions and prophecies, what they're actually doing is they're validating and deepening our faith. That when we see Jesus, we see and recognize who he is because of what, what's been told of him. But, oh, this is the one. He crushed Satan's head. This is the one who bore our iniquities. This is the one who's establishing his, his kingdom. We understand Christ and validate for us who Christ is by the prophecies of old. And by seeing those, we see the, the depth and the beauty and the need of Jesus. The need of, of Jesus' one, the, the, the answer to the one problem we had. By the one plan through Jesus. Which is another thing, as we, as we recognize biblical theology, right? That, that God, we had this one problem, which was sin. And the answer to that whole problem, that whole time, was Jesus. You know, sometimes we look at God, and this is, is a, a mistake to look at. And we look at God as like trying to pull out all kind of plan B, plan C. But he's like, how do I fix this problem? We've got a big sin problem. How do we fix it? Well, well let's try Noah. Okay, Noah didn't work. And let, let's try David. Well, David didn't work. And like, he, he's just throwing all kinds of, uh, of attempts at it. He's like a, a, a parent trying to get their kids to eat vegetables. And it's like, you know, you first you start with some logic. You're like, it'll be big and strong, you know. Oh, that didn't work. You're like, well, how about some dessert? Okay, that didn't work. How about punishment? I'm going to take away the screen. Okay, that didn't work. You know, it's like, you're just like, whatever works, I'm just going to throw it at you. And that's not what God is. Like, like God's not trying to come up with what the plan B is. Sometimes we think of that. We, we see Israel. Oh, Israel failed. And, okay, that was plan A. What is, what is God trying to do to come up with plan B? The, the, Jesus was plan A from the beginning. It, it, it was never Noah. It was never David. It, it, it was never Moses. It was never, it, it, was never, it was never Israel. The plan for the salvation of his people was always Jesus. What they longed for and sought, we actually get to taste. It's a privilege, brothers and sisters. Not just the prophets, though. It doesn't just end with the prophets. We're not just privileged when it comes to where we stand in, in relation to the prophets. We're privileged in relation to where we stand with angels. And that, this is great, right? Angels, what was preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. That's the, so the gospel that's been given to us, those things, the, the, the things of the gospel into which angels long to look. Isn't that an amazing sentence? That angels who are in the presence of God and, and, and who are enjoying the, the, this, whatever that spiritual life looks like, they are actually, there's a sense where they wish they had what we had. Again, not in a, in a sinful, jealous, or envious way, but, but there, there's something that we've tasted that they, because they're angels, they can't taste. There's something of redemption and grace that as angels, they don't get to taste. I suppose first we should recognize this thing that, hey, Angels are real. Does that surprise you? <laughs> like angels are real. And of course, if you're a Christian, you're like, well, of course they're real. They're, they're in the Bible. But did you actually think about that? I, I mean, there's, so we, we kind of see two ways. When it comes to angels and demons and stuff, we kind of go in two different directions, right? There's kind of a group of us that are probably overly obsessed with it. And we try to figure out all that, what angels are. And we, we try to dig out the most obscure thing of Scripture and try to create an entire theology about it. And, and so there's some of us that probably do that. But but more likely, most of us ignore the reality that there is a spiritual realm and spiritual beings. Most of us day-to-day -day 
go through our lives acting like what we can touch and feel and see is all that exists in the world. That that's simply all there is. And even though we, we claim Christ, we live as materialists. And so let, let, me, let me challenge you this morning to recognize that angels and the spiritual beings and the spiritual realm is a very true realm. What I don't want to do is to try to build out what that realm looks like. You would be unfaithful to this text. And, and frankly, there's just more questions we have than answers. We know that angels exist. We, we know that they are in a sense of a heavenly realm. We know that they come and minister among us. We actually know because of Hebrews 1, 14, that they are, one of the purposes is to minister to us and for us. Like, like there, there's a way that they even were privileged just to have the, just as the prophets served us, so did the, the angels serve us. But, but we don't know. Does everybody have their own guardian angel? I don't have any idea. I, you know, we, we have all these kind of ideas we try to figure out. But here's one thing. Here's one thing we know for sure. Whatever privilege and, and, and beauty and treasure that they, they hold as angels, it's not greater than what we have. That, that whatever blessing that they experience as angels, they wish they had what we have. Right? And so think about that. Think about when you, you think of angels sitting up in heaven, probably on a cloud, probably playing a harp. I don't know, I don't know what that picture in your mind is, but there's all kinds of, go, go look at medieval art with angels and, and see all kinds of crazy pictures about what maybe what angels are doing in the heavenly realm. Now, whatever, whatever's really there, whatever they really have, whatever they've truly taken hold of is not greater than what Christ has let us take hold of. That should blow your mind. Whatever blessing it is for them to be in the heavenly realms with Christ is not greater to have experienced the grace of salvation and redemption in Jesus Christ. How, how could we neglect the privilege that we have? Church, don't, don't miss the privilege that's been given to you in Jesus Christ, the, the privilege of salvation, the treasure of salvation. The prophets sought our privilege. The angels desire our privilege. Let me talk about three symptoms. Okay, we have a privilege. The question is, are we actually treasuring and beholding that? Are we actually seeing that? Are, are, we, are we seeing that the joy of our salvation or, or do we miss and just see everything else? Have we taken our salvation for granted? Do we have this eye disease? Let me give three symptoms of eye disease. First, that privilege which has been given to us in Jesus Christ, that privilege, we no longer derive joy from it. We no longer derive joy from the reality that Christ has saved us from eternal punishment and separation, that he has saved us to eternal joy and glory, that, that, that he has saved us to a, a heavenly home beyond anything we can comprehend. He has saved us and given us the most valuable thing in the world, and yet we, we don't find any joy in it. We're like, eh, it's good. I hope I go to heaven. That'd be good. Better than hell, I guess. I mean, is that your posture to this thing? Did, did when you consider what Christ has done for you, do you does this, the, the joy well up within you? I mean, even in the midst of difficult things and, and, and suffering and, and painful things and, and, and disease and relational conflict, you, you, can you, are you able to stop and look at it and go, but wow, look at what I have. Have you actually tasted? Have you, I mean, the salvation of Christ is one of those, I mean, it's just one of those addictive things. Like, once you taste it, you just can't get enough of it. Like, it, it never grows old. It, it's that cake that you just like, you got to take it away from me because I'll eat it all night long. And, it, and you just don't, but, but, or has salvation to you become, eh, eh not bad. Has, have you gotten to the point where salvation has, doesn't lead you into joy? You don't drive joy from it anymore. That's a symptom. That's a symptom that you're not treasuring what Christ has given you. A second symptom, 
And this is very, very much related to the first symptom. Maybe even an elevated symptom in some sense. But do you try to replace it? Um, you, you try to replace it, not in the sense of like you try to get some other, okay, okay, I don't want my salvation, I'm going to get some other salvation. But, but because you're not deriving joy from it, though you're trying to kind of hold on to it, you're actually trying to be satisfied by something other than the treasure that Christ has given you in your salvation. That though I'm, tr- I'm kind of trying to say, yes, I'm saved, I live my life looking for some other joy and satisfaction outside of Christ. That there's something my soul longs for that I'm seeking, that, uh, that there's a comfort I want that I can no longer get from Christ, so I'm trying to seek it in something else. And, and it's all kinds of something else, right? I mean, this is, at the heart of what we're talking about, this is what idolatry is. It's, it's when I'm not being satisfied by Christ, I'm going to try to be satisfied by something else. When I don't trust Christ to satisfy me, I will trust something else to satisfy him. And, and even as Christians, we we try to have these little idols that, that satisfy. You know, I love travel. Like, I, I like going on vacations, and there's nothing wrong with, with going on an, a vacation here and there. There's nothing wrong with, with resting in, in those kinds of ways. But, but even that can be the place that I look for my comfort and my satisfaction. Do you, do you get back from a vacation and immediately think, oh, I wonder where else we can go? When do I get some more time off? Or what else can I see? What else can I do? It's like your whole life is ordered in, in what you can go experience. The, the leisure and the comfort or, the, or, or something of that vacation brings. You know, maybe it's in your kids. Maybe your, your whole satisfaction, everything you're wrapping up all your hope in is, is seeing Junior become a Major League Baseball player. Right? I'm just going to tell you. Most of your juniors aren't going to be major league baseball players. Junior, if you're in here, I'm sorry you had to hear that. So, but we can, we can order our life. And again, like vacations aren't bad and, and baseball is not bad, but we, we, when it wraps up our whole life where we're no longer getting joy from this, we're going to say, hey, what else out there can we get joy from? It becomes our replacement for Christ. Well, when this is no longer satisfying, when the, when the salvation of Christ is no longer satisfying, we start looking for satisfaction in something else, in, in relationships, in, in things, in honor and status. If I don't understand the privilege I have in the gospel, who I am in Jesus, my acceptance of God the Father, I'm going to start looking to be accepted by something else. A lot of us will use work for that. My identity, this is, this is who I am, I'm, I'm building my career, I'm getting my honor from the, I'm getting honor from that instead of Christ because it ultimately satisfies. If you look at your heart, if you, if you examine yourself, if, if you prayfully invite the Holy Spirit to reveal to yourself, where are you finding your joy and satisfaction? Is it in the salvation that Christ has given you or is it in something else? We, we try to replace our, our joy when we can't see the privilege we have. This is a, I'll end on this one. This is the the last symptom of our, of our eye disease, a prevalent one. This is probably going to be popular among us. We don't share it. If we don't see and understand and treasure the privilege of salvation that Christ has given to us, we don't share it with others. So there's a unique thing about our privilege that's that's different than many other privileges. Like, you often think of being in a privileged place and privileged people actually trying to protect that privilege. You think of these, these extremely exclusive, like, social clubs in New York City where people have to pay tens of thousands of dollars every year. They have initiation fee first, and then every year they pay tens of thousands of dollars to be a part of this particular club that, that communicates a particular privilege. And, and they want to keep it that way. They, they, they raise those initiation rates, and, and they bring up the fees so that there will be privilege. Because if you let everyone in, then, oh, there's really just no privilege about it. And and so they're trying to, I mean, that's how, that's how privilege often works, is we don't want too many people to be privileged because it, it undermines my own privilege. That's not the gospel privilege. The gospel privilege is the exact opposite. If you've really tasted of the gospel privilege, what you want to do is give it to others. You want to see others enjoy the same privilege that you have. You recognize that you've done nothing to earn this privilege. There's nothing we did to make ourselves pure. There's nothing we did to make our hands clean. Christ gave it to us. 
And it's such a gift that when we treasure it rightly, we will be compelled to share it widely. And, and so if you're not, if, if that isn't even a desire for you to share the gospel with others, I'm saying, have you, are, are you seeing it? Are you treasuring it? You, you see, that's how, I mean, the, the way this thing, the way the privilege actually operates in going forth is by people who have received the, the privilege, are filled by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit compels them to propel that privilege forward. In these things, the gospel that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit. You received the privilege because the Holy Spirit working in someone led them to announce that and preach that to you. And you heard it and you believed. And as a part of that privilege, God gave you the Holy Spirit. And now you and, and me, we go forward and we, by that same Holy Spirit stirring and working in us, tell the privilege to others that we may add to that number. People who people who see and taste and experience the privilege share the privilege. And so church, my, my challenge for us is is to ask those questions of ourselves. Don't miss the privilege. Are, are we a people who are treasuring, are treasuring this, this salvation that we have in, in such a way that would compel us to share it with others? And here's, not what, here's what I'm not telling us. Rush out there and just start, start living like it and, and get out there and, and preach it. I mean, in some ways, yes, but, but here's the reality. The reality is if you don't first see it, you'll never really communicate it. If you don't first see it, you won't truly love it. If you, if you don't first see it, it won't change you. And, and so the challenge for us, is, as much as go out and live it, is, is have we actually seen it? Do, do you see your privilege? Do you see the gospel salvation? That's being, do you see the joy in it? Because when you truly do, when you truly come to grasp with what Christ has done for you, the sharing of it will take care of itself. Let's pray. Oh, Father, who are we? Who are we as a people who are, who are sinful? Who are we as a people who are unpure and, and have unclean hands? Who are we to, to count it a relationship with you? Who are we to, to take on Christ's righteousness? Who are we that you would suffer and die on our behalf? God, I pray that you would help us see that. Lord, help us see the, the, the gospel that you've given us. Help, help us see and taste of this thing others have longed to taste. Help us not believe that it's anything to do with our merit, that our reward that we have gone out and, and earned this privilege. But God, because you are kind and gracious and merciful, because you love to demonstrate your love and compassion to a people, Lord, you have given it to us. Lord, I pray that we would see. Lord, if there are those in this church today who are struggling to treasure what you have done for them, they're struggling, struggling to see the salvation that you have bestowed upon them, the, the treasure they have. Lord, I pray that you would open their eyes. Lord, and as we see, and as we delight, and as we joy, we would go forth for your glory to proclaim the good news of Christ to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.